Christmas uh, celebration. And so what we want to do is we wanted to kind of tie in uh, what we have been studying uh, to the celebration of this time of year. And uh, because the Bible is totally interconnected. The Bible is connected. Everything in the Bible is connected to everything else in the Bible. And so I want to show and uh, prove that to you. And so uh, this time we, we were studying the book of Ezekiel. Uh, and we went from Ezekiel to the book of Revelation. And all those deal with the uh, establishment, either the kingdom or the king himself. And so uh, I thought it was befitting that we go and start at the very beginning and, and pick up some things. And so uh, by doing that, we want, we need, first of all, I want to dispel some myths, uh, separate some myths out. So if you would open your Bible to the Gospel according to St. Luke, and we're going to see how all this is attached together. The Gospel according to St. Luke. And uh, we're going to look at uh, chapter number two. Chapter number two. Uh, there's a song that uh, we sing in our churches, and uh, normally uh, the, the, we sing the song celebrating one thing when, we, when it's really written to celebrate something else. We sing the song, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come, Let Earth Receive Her King. And uh, as you listen to the words of that song, you'll find out that that song has not been fulfilled yet. The earth has not received her king. Every uh, heart is not prepared in a room. And so uh, that song speaks of a future uh, advent, not the first advent. Normally we sing it in relation to the first uh, coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he will come, and he will come and establish his kingdom. And that's what the millennium is about, is about him establishing the kingdom that he promised uh, David. And so uh, even in the book of Acts, they go back and they talk about how he's going to rebuild the temple and reestablish uh, the things of David. Now, I want, I want to say this. Uh, when you go back uh, or when we go forward to the millennium, you'll find out that the uh, temple sacrifices are reestablished. And uh, they are reestablished looking back towards the cross, whereas during the day of... Uh, uh, Aaron, it was looking forward to the cross. And, and again, that's, that's why we even study those things today because they speak uh, some things about Jesus and they help us understand and, and to know him. But anyway, uh, let's look there in um, St. Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 1 it says and I'm reading from the New King James it says, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Now, I want you to understand something. When it mentions an individual's name, Caesar doesn't have anything to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. But the reason his name is mentioned, it tells you during what period this is happening and how, or how God used Caesar or, or used the government to arrange things for him. So, Caesar Augustus is the one that gives this decree. Verse number 2 says, The census first took place while Quirinius was uh, governing Syria. So again, these are reference points that you can go back in secular history and find these points. It says, So, uh, uh, when to be registered. It says, Everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, this decree had to go forth so that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Now, remember, uh, you picked up Bethlehem back uh, with the story of Ruth and Boaz. Okay. So again, the whole the Bible is tied together. It says because uh, he was of the house and of the lineage of David. It said, verse five says to be registered with Mary, uh, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth 
uh, her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Now, listen to the way he comes into this world. He's the firstborn. He's, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes are actually sh uh, swatches of burial clothes. So he's born for the purpose to die. He comes in being wrapped up in burial clothes. And he's lying in a manger. That's like an animal trough. So he doesn't come, he's not born into the palace. He's not born into luxury. Uh, he's actually in a, in, a, in a stable or in a barn, or we would say in a cave back then because there was no room for him at the end. Now remember, he's the Lord of glory, but there is no room for him. This uh, speaks of something moving forward. That there, he was born to die. That's one thing we get out of it. The other thing that we get out of it is for the most part, there's not going to be any room. What do you mean? Not amongst the religious leaders. Not amongst people. There's not going to be any room. Most people will not have room for him. Okay. Then look at verse 8. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now you understand that there were shepherds out in the fields near the temple because they were the ones that kept the uh, flocks that were used for the temple sacrifices. But the shepherds themselves would be considered unclean. It says, and Behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were greatly afraid. Now, isn't this interesting that God comes to the lowly, common individuals, the ones that most folk would uh, figure to be unclean? But remember, he said that he didn't come to save those that thought they were righteous. He come for those that were sick and that knew they were sick. It says, then the angel said unto him, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring a, a good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Now notice, that this is not to just the Jews, but this is for all people. It says, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It says, and he will be, and, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So now understand this. These angels are not talking to some priests. These angels are talking to the shepherds. Isn't this interesting? He, he's, they're talking to common people. It says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Goodwill toward men. Now, we usually say the, other, uh, the angelic choir had got together and sang a song. Okay? I don't know which one they sang, but anyway. It says, uh, so it was when the angels had gone away from them unto heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, let us now go, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So he makes it known to the shepherds by an, an, an angelic visitation. Okay. Now I want you to understand something. God does not always make himself known to everybody by the same method. Keep in mind that he makes himself known to the shepherds by an angelic visitation. Now usually shepherds are uneducated folk. So there's some things that just wouldn't, I mean, there's some things that would just kind of go over their head. So God meets them where they are. Okay. And again, this is another lesson. We can't meet people where we're at. We have to meet people where they are. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you another <coughs> contrast, how God again speaks to another group of people, but he's going to use a totally different method. Look what he says. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying where? He's lying in a manger. Okay. And when they had seen him, they made, uh, they made widely known the same, which was told them concerning the child. So they began to tell some folk. And all of those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now here's another thing. When people truly come into a connection with God, 
there is a reaction. Yes. These guys are excited. Yes. These guys, I mean, they telling them, they telling everybody. So these people that say that they have met the Lord and then they become secret agents, it makes you have to wonder whether or not they really met the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because it'll make you happen. It'll make you say something. Yes. Do you remember various folk that encountered Jesus Christ and Jesus had to tell them, don't tell nobody. Mm -hmm. Because they was, hey, they said, no, we're going to tell somebody. Remember the man that was among the tombs? He said, no, no. He told everybody. He told everybody. The one man that Jesus said, rise up and walk and don't go show yourself. He told everybody. He told everybody. So when God actually works with and on you, you're going to want to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so again, he, he uh, meets them and he shares, the angel shares with them the fact that uh, Jesus the Christ uh, is born. Now, this is how this group of individuals uh, receive it. Let's go just a little bit further and then we'll have to go to the book of St. Matthew. It says, and when eight days were complete from the circumcision of Christ, his name was called Yeshua. In your Bible it says Jesus. Yeshua, the name given by the angels before he was conceived in his mother's womb. Now, Mary didn't get a chance to pick this baby's name. The name was already set up, set forth, and reserved. His name was Yeshua. Yeshua. Or Yah, who Or Jehovah, who saves. It says, now when the days of her purification, purification according to the law of Moses were complete, they brought him to Jer Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Okay, now, so again, this is biblical for people to bring their babies mm -hmm. and present them, dedicate them to the Lord. Now, notice this is a ded uh, baby dedication. This is not a baby baptism. You only baptize believers. You can dedicate things to the Lord, but, but, but the Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized. So uh, people use this a lot of times. They say, well, see, I, I showed you Jesus was being baptized. No, he wasn't being baptized here. Later on, he's baptized, and we'll pick that up. Now, if this was a baptism, the baptism that happened later on wasn't necessary because he'd already been baptized. Mm -hmm. But they presented him to the temple so that they could dedicate him just as Hannah dedicated her child. It says in verse 23, and it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. Man, now this, again, this speaks to the sanctity of life. Everyone that's born is holy to the Lord. Now, uh, if, if you have some time, you need to read through the rest of this because you will see how later on, uh, somewhere around verse number 30, 32, it talks about the Gentiles. How he's going to be a, even a light unto the Gentiles. But now we need to go back to the book of St. Matthew, which is Jewish, and see what it has to say. And I, I think you're going to find some interesting stuff in here. All right. Uh, let's, let's get, since, since we're in the season, let's go up and get the story. Let's start at St. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 18. St. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 18. All right. You will find these words. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, uh, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now, I always have to stop here and talk about the character of Joseph. God put him in the care of a man that had character. How, how do we know this? When, when Mary uh, came to Joseph and said, uh, Joe, got something to tell you. Uh, I'm pregnant. Now, Joe knows that he, ain't, he hasn't been with her. He hasn't been with her. Now, he could make this uh, public and messy, but he does not. He, he operates secretly. Why? Because he has a love for her. When people do things messily, they're, they're proclaiming to you what type of love it, it is that they have for you. 
when, when they want to drag you through the mud, it makes you kind of think, did you, did you, did you really love, you know? See, love does, love does not cease just because you get ready to cease a, a relationship. He's getting ready to end the relationship right here. He's getting ready to put her away secretly, divorce her secretly, but he does not do that. Okay? Now remember, in Isaiah 7 and 14, it said that the Lord himself should give you a sign, that a virgin shall have a child. Now how can a virgin have a child and no man at the same time? It's not possible. But even when God does what he says he's going to do, sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend. Now, you know Joseph would have known about this scripture. But it's kind of hard for us to even comprehend how God's going to do this. It's hard for us sometimes to receive what God says he's going to do. Sometimes he does it very, uh, shall we say, miraculously. Okay. It says, verse 20. But while he thought about these things, he's thinking about doing this. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, uh, Joseph, son of David. Now, why does the angel say Joseph, son of David? Because what he's trying to do is to remind Joseph, you are of the lineage of the king, son of David. And it is through the son of David that God is going to do something miraculous. He's trying to remind Joseph, Joseph, you're part of prophecy being fulfilled. Listen to what it says. Don't be afraid to take to you, Mary, your wife. And in other words, what he's saying is, don't be afraid to take on this controversy. Don't be afraid to take on the, you know, because it's going to be shameful. This is, gonna, I mean, come on now. You got, you got this woman traveling with you and she's pregnant and People said, y'all ain't married yet, are you? <laughs> what not, what not, we, uh, this is a shame. Y'all, you, 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 what we have here is a case of two adulterers. So this is shameful. So he's willingly going to take on this shame. I'm trying to show you something. Sometimes for the sake of Christ, you're going to have to be willingly shamed. Most people ain't into that. We, we, we are into willingly famed. We want to be famed for him. But we don't want to be shamed for him. Now remember, he was shamed when they hung him on the cross. He was shamed. He wasn't famed. He was shamed. But, but look at our mindset. We want to be famed and, and we want to skip over shame. Look what it says. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. He said well, I don't care whatever you're thinking about. This is something that was done by God. Notice, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua or Jesus. Now again, she didn't get to pick the name, and guess what? You're not gonna get to pick it either. You know, sometimes we want our way, but God says, "I don't need your way when I got a way. What what I need you to do is do my way, whether you understand it or not." It says, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being translated, God with us. God with us. Now, John attests to this very same thing. What he says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he comes down in verse number 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is none other than God himself. It says, uh, then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. So this was done in a dream. So now we're going to find out something. God speaks to people in dreams many times. And sometimes God will give you the interpretation of dreams. We're going to find out the importance of dreams. Okay. And he says, uh, and he did not know her until she had brought forth the first son, and he called his name Jesus. So uh, he, he, he was not intimate with her and could not be intimate with her until Jesus came forth. Now he's going to get the blame. He's going to get the blame. Here's the important part, chapter number two. 
And this is where our, our actual Bible study is going to begin. Chapter 2 of Matthew says, Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now this is important. And behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen what? His star in the east. And have come to worship him. So they're coming from the east. And they have seen his star. Wait a minute. He has a star? Mm -hmm. They have seen his star in the east. They said we're coming to worship him. It says now when Herod the king heard this. He was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now I need to stop right here. And share with you why he's troubled. Okay. Now most people think that he's just troubled. Because somebody said, where is he that is born uh, king of the Jews? And because Herod was a sick, paranoid man. And that is true. He was a sick, paranoid man. He did not want anybody to take his throne. And uh, if there was anybody that was going to take his seat, he was going to make sure, not while I'm living. It is said that it was better to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. Because, you know, Jews don't eat pigs. Okay. Now, even though Herod was not a full-blooded Jew, he was what's called an Edomitium. Okay. Uh, Edomitium. That is somebody that was converted to Judaism, possibly had some Jewish blood, but was converted to Judaism uh, back when the Jews had conquered uh, some of that area. Uh, you have people who were Samaritans that were not totally Jewish, but they have Jewish blood. So the Edomitiums are considered by the Romans Jews. They put them all together. And so this is why the Romans made Herod king of the Jews, because they figured, you a Jew too, right? Okay, but he's, he's, the Jewish folk don't see him that way. But he would have adopted all of the Jewish customs. All right, look at verse number, well, no, before we go, let me, let me tell you why there was so, so much trouble going on, okay? Uh, you have to know a little bit of the history of the Bible and the area of the Bible. At this particular time, Rome is not fully in control of Jerusalem. Okay? There is a, uh, some e unease going on between two kingdoms or two uh, uh, armies. One is the kingdom of Rome, we'll call it the kingdom, and the other is the Parthian kingdom. Okay? Now, the Parthian kingdom is, is in one direction in the east coming towards the west yeah. and Rome is west coming towards the east and in the middle is a little place called Judea which is a buffer zone for these two kingdoms and whenever a fight broke out between these two kingdoms guess where they ended up fighting right there in, around in Jerusalem it was a it was a place where it was a place always a war. It was a place where two nations could collide. Jerusalem is the the joining point of the east and the west and the north and the south. Jerusalem is the in-between part. So for quite a while, the Parthians uh, would dominate in that area. But also Rome was laying claim to that area. So what Rome did. Before they even, uh, uh, shall I say, occupied the area, they set Herod up as king in that area. And for quite a while, uh, Herod was the king that couldn't even be in his own kingdom because of the turmoil that was going on. So now he's there, okay? Uh, he has Rome on one side, the Parthian Empire on the other side, and now you have these Parthians coming. Now understand, when we, when we look at it, we think, about these three guys riding on camels coming to worship him. That is not what happened. Okay? Let's read a little bit more, then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about this. It says, uh, verse number four, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where that Christ was to be born. Now, of course, they're going to go back and they're going to consult the scriptures and, and in uh, the, the scriptures that tells us Bethlehem. So they said to him, Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. But 
you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Jews. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now, remember, Harry is not interested in somebody else shepherding the people because he's the shepherd right now. And listen, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them uh, what time the star appeared. Now, Herod is saying, when did y'all see this star? See, because that would have been when the child was born. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Liar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw, wait a minute. And when they had come into the house, he's no longer in a manger, in a stable, or in a barn. He's in a house. He done moved to the house. When you meet Jesus out in the field, don't keep him there. Yes. Move him to the house. Yes. Yes. Move him to the house. Where's the house? You the house. That's right. Move him into the house. And then because it's in the house that you can make presentation to him. That's what he's interested in, being in the house. You remember in the book of Revelation, he's knocking because he's on the outside the house. Trying to get in the house. So he wants to be in the house. You remember in the book of Exodus, he said, let them make me a tabernacle that I may dwell. He wants to be in the house. During the celebration of Sukkot, called by the Jews a tabernacle, he wants to tabernacle or dwell with them. How do you dwell? In the house. In the house. All right. It says, verse 11, and when they had come unto the house, they saw the young child and Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. And they had opened their treasures and presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and now, this is where we get three kings. Okay. Because we figured gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we figured, you know, each one had a box. Okay. But I want you to understand something. The Bible does not say it was three kings. The Bible does not say that it was three wise men. You know, I, I know what the, 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 uh, the songs say, but that's, that's incorrect. This would have been a large contingency of dignitaries. And not only, and this is why Herod would have been troubled, is because they would have come with armed guard. They would have come with armed guard. Now see, they, they used to see people coming, uh, they're like, oh God, just get ready to be another war. Now when they say they're going to crown somebody king of the Jews, now wait a minute. You mean you people from the east are getting ready to make a king of the Jews when the Romans have already made a king? Oh, you might as well have a fight between Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> I just thought I'd put that in there. <laughs> but yeah, they're like, oh, oh, Lord, that means that's going to, the, the reason that that whole region is now trouble, because this means war. Sure. If there's going to be a king crowned and the Parthians are coming, this, this, they, and they've been used to war. <laughs> they've been used to war happening. And, and listen, you need to study that history of the Parthians and the, and the Roman empires clashing with one another because there's a bunch of times that the Parthians kicked the Romans' butts. I mean, they, they, they whooped them. And so that, that, this is why they're so, they're so troubled. But now the question that we have to ask now is who are these wise men and how do they know? Okay. Now the Parthian empire is from the east and it is what would have been uh, before called Parthians it would have been the Persian Empire. It would have been the media Persian Empire. Okay? It would have been the area where Babylon had once ruled, had once been. And so these guys that are coming 
are magi, what we call magi. These are, these are wise men. And there are two things that the magi were noted for. Number one, well, no, there's a couple of things. Let's see. Number three things. Let's say three things. Number one, they were interpreter of dreams. They could interpret dreams. Number two, they were educated in astronomy. Now, you notice I said astronomy. They were educated in astronomy. And number three, they were called kingmakers. They were called kingmakers. During the Media Persian Empire, if a king got sick or a king died, it was these wise men that got together and crowned and determined who the next king was going to be. And so now I'm going to show you how this, the Bible is so interconnected and how, they, how would these wise men know to bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh? I want to share with you that they were instructed to bring these gifts. Why these, why these gifts, anyway? Well, gold is what you would bring a king. Mm -hmm. You bring that to him. Frankincense is what you would bring a priest. Mm -hmm. Because when a priest is going to make offering, he want to sprinkle it with frankincense so when it's, when it's burned up, it's a sweet smell, it's a sweet aroma. Mm -hmm. And so this is why the frankincense. And the myrrh was for burial. Yes. And so this is why you had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this is prophetically already telling you what this Savior is going to do are the functions that he's going to perform. He's going to be a king, he's going to be a priest, and he's going to lay down his life. See, God, God was showing all of this ahead of time. All of this ahead of time. But, but we got to go back to these magi. Who are these guys? Where do they come from? Well, we're going to go back in your Bible uh, to the book of Daniel. We've got to go back to the book of Daniel. So let's see if we can find Daniel. He, he, he's not lost. He's in the Old Testament. He's right after Ezekiel. All right. Daniel chapter number two. Daniel chapter number two. Now, for the for the time of uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to read all of this, but I want to go through some of this for you. Daniel happened to be part of those that were taken in the first uh, siege of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and uh, the first time they seized Jerusalem, they took uh, those that were educated. Those that were educated, because if you want to strengthen yourself, you don't take the dummies. You take those that are that have something to offer, mm -hmm. and you take, so they take the educated. And so what they do with the educated, they uh, receive what they know, but they also instruct them in new ways. So Daniel becomes a part of the court of Babylon and of Nebuchadnezzar. Now I'm going to show you how God works things out. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And he is horrified because he does not understand what this dream is all about. Mm -hmm. And so he calls his wise men and he tells them, he said, y'all need to tell me about this dream. And they, they say, okay, king, uh, you, you tell us and we'll interpret it. Because that's what they do, they interpret dreams. He said, no, no, because I know y'all. <laughs> y'all might make up something. <laughs> so I tell you what, he said, now I know God wants you to tell me what the dream means. I want you to tell me the dream. And, it's, and they said, King, can't nobody do this. Only the God that is in heaven that can do this. Let's pick up in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariad. Now Ariad is the keeper of everybody. And he says to the captain of, of the king's guard who had gone to kill the wise men in Babylon. See, see, the king said, if y'all can't tell me the answer to this to my question, he said, I'll kill all y'all. Family and everybody. I'll kill. I don't need y'all give me a whole new set. I'll kill all y'all. <laughs> now remember, part of the group is Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And so they, they're part of that group that has a death sentence. 
But Daniel answers it, verse 15, and he said to Ariok, the king's captain, uh, what, why is this decree from the king so urgent? He said, wait a minute, what's the hurry? Then Ariok made a, uh, a decision, this decision known to Daniel. So Daniel met in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Now, wait a minute. Daniel asked for time. Don't you just love these people that you, you, you go to, you go to, I was going to say go to church. You go to church and you say, listen, I'm going to talk to you. I had this dream. And they're going to give it to you right then and right there. I don't want you to give it to me right then and right there. I want you to go and pray about it. I don't want you to just give me something off the top of your head. You might make a mistake, and this is critical. I need you to go and seek God. And a lot of times, uh, many times we as preachers make the mistake of not seeking God first before we tell people what we're going to do, this, that, or the other. Do you remember uh, somebody, David came to uh, the prophet and he said, you know, I want to build God a house. And the prophet said, you know what, that sounds good. Go ahead, do everything that's in your heart. Now, because it sounded good. But how many of y'all know good and God is two different things? It can't just be good, it got to be God. There's a lot of my stuff that ain't God's stuff. So after the prophet had some time to seek God about it, he came back and said, hold it, hold it, stop, wait up, hold up. Hey, God said, you can't do it. You got blood on your hands. You can't do it. So his son, his son did it. So it's good, it's good that the prophet backed up and said, you know what, I made a mistake. I spoke too soon. I shouldn't have said nothing. I hadn't talked to God yet. A lot of times in churches when people come, and they say, you know, I'm getting ready to do this. I need, I need to know from God. You have to say, well, time out. You need to know from God, and I do too. I'll let you know when I hear from you. All right, verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Now, notice it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. These are their Chaldean names. Right now, you need to hear from God. <laughs> you know, you, you need to, yeah. So he says in verse number 18, that they might seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this secret. So what is he doing? He's calling a prayer meeting with his friends. Ain't that something? I guess if more folk would read this, you'd have more people come to prayer meeting. Like, I need an answer from God. Well, you evidently you ain't serious about it. Because you ain't told your friends to get together and let's pray and see what God says. You just want to do what you want to do. Okay, it says, that, no, look there, that they may seek mercies from the God of heaven and study the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a what? Night vision. So Daniel blessed God, blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. So Daniel goes in and he gives the interpretation. He tells him the dream. Then he tells him the interpretation of the dream. And so as a reward, uh, the king uh, promotes Daniel. Look there in uh, the 42nd verse of chapter number 2. And it says, And then King Nebuchadnezzar, fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel. Now, wait a minute. The king has fallen before Daniel. He's recognizing, now, he really ain't fallen to Daniel. He recognized that Daniel has a word from God in his mouth. And so he's really fallen before the Lord of heaven. Listen, he says, and he commanded that they should present an offering, an incense to him. And then the king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. He makes him ruler over Babylon. Boy, don't this story sound familiar? And, and, and chief administrator. He is the supreme, yes, yeah, he's the supreme ruler, chief administrator over the wise men of Babylon. Wait a minute. He's the chief administrator over who? The Magi. He is over the men. Now, wait a minute. He, who are the Magi? The Magi were a, from a, uh, a, actually a religious family, just like the Levites were. But they were, their origin is Arizona, uh, is, uh, Arizona, 
Zoroastrianism. That's their origin. But there's some things in there that are very similar to the Jewish belief, which is there's a certain family set aside to serve as the priest. And so these, and these priests came from a, a, a group that were called Medes. Family, the family was the Mead family, okay? But now the Mead family is being presided over by a Jew. How many of y'all know that don't, that don't one look? If you want to get a fight going, take somebody from the outside mm -hmm. and put them over the folk that are already there from the end. So, oh, you got a fight getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. they, they ain't trying to hear that. But he is the chief. Wait a minute. They didn't, he didn't make him a part. He made him the chief over all of that. And uh, also, now, now what, what, watch what Daniel does. Also, Daniel positioned, uh, petitioned the king that he would set Shadrach. Now, see, he's talking to the king. So the king don't know that it's Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. So Daniel said, uh, no, I need some help. I can't do it by myself. So he brings in some more guys. He brings in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel said it the gate of the king. So, so, so Daniel has brought in his buddies. So now, part of the Magi consists of some Jews. Now, what do you think Daniel starts doing? He starts teaching them the ways of his God. You got Jews that are now part of the Magi. I'm trying to show you what God is, how God is working this thing. Okay, I'm trying to show you who the Magi are. Now, so Daniel knows the scriptures. And so now what he's going to do, he's going to make sure that the Magi know the scriptures. That the, if you're going to be wise, you got to have information, right? Mm -hmm. So Daniel got to provide you with information. How uh, Bethlehem is going, there's going to be a king born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Now remember, these guys already are studiers of the stars. An interpreter of dreams. And Daniel is educating them. Now, now, uh, now a little bit later on in the media Persian Empire, uh, there was a woman by the name of uh, Hadessa. Mm -hmm. Does anybody remember Hadessa? Yes. You probably know her by the name of Esther. Yes. Oh. And uh, <laughs> King, the king of, of the king of Persia yes. uh, threw a party and uh, he asked his wife, uh, King Vash Queen Vashti, yeah. to come out so he could show her off. And uh, she refused. Yes. She's like, I ain't coming. I ain't coming. Now, he was willing to let it slide until some of the brethren brought it to his attention. I said, now, King, if you let her talk to you that way, if you let her disrespect you, if you let her diss you that way, <laughs> Then the other women in the kingdom <laughs> gonna think it's all right to diss their husbands, and then what we gonna have? <laughs> how, how, how's that gonna work? We gonna have hell in the house. Yes. That ain't gonna work. And so he said, "Well, I'm gonna have to set her down, mm. and I'm gonna have to find somebody else." Mm -hmm. And so, and so they they look out through the kingdom, and somebody nominates. Somebody said, "I I I I, I nominate her death. Dessa. She got an uncle who's working for the king. They Mordecai, Mordecai. He's working for the king. Now wait a minute. What is he? He's a wise man working for the king. I wonder how he got there. <laughs> now wait a minute. So so he he gets he gets uh, Esther in with the king, right? And y'all know the story. There is a wicked man by the name of Haman. He's an anti-Semite. He yes. can't stand you. Yes. And so he's been always trying to get Mordecai kicked out. But Mordecai is a smart, wise man. The king kind of likes him. And uh, so, but he plans to get Mordecai. He plans to get him. And while he's planning to get Mordecai, he also plans to get the rest of the Jews while I'm at it. Mm -hmm. And y'all know the story. Uh, Esther finds out and she begins to pray. And she begins to tell Mordecai, I tell the folk to call a prayer meeting. Yes. Get everybody to get a prayer meeting. Yes. Am I saying something? Get everybody a prayer meeting. Let them pray. Mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, Mordecai comes back and he says, Listen, you, you, you need to 
reproached the king. How do we know you wasn't born for such a time as this? Mm -hmm. She said, well, you, you don't know us. I go in and he ain't call for me. He can ask for my death. Yes. He said, now don't you think, when, with this decree that they have made, don't you think you're going to escape? Because you're a Jew just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And so she gets made up in her mind, I'm going to go to see the king. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to go to see the king. And, 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 and she, she comes in. You know, I think, I think she, you know, the, the scripture don't say this. But you know she didn't come looking any old kind of way. No, she, she, come, she came looking her best. You know, the Bible says when you enter his course with thanksgiving, mm -hmm. enter his course with praise, you ought to come bringing something. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you yes. going into the presence of the king. I'm trying to tell you, girl, something. When you're ready to go into the presence of the king, you say he's your king. Yeah. Make him feel like he's yeah. your king. Yeah. Look like he's the king. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> and he, listen, he looked at her. He looked at her. And he said, where am I set there? See, because you got to extend the scepter. She he said, where am I? Touch it, girl. Touch it. You come on in here. What can I do for you? And, and well, you, and you, you know how the story went. Well, uh, to make a long story short, Haman has devised this uh, scheme to get all the Jews killed. He's even made a, a gallows to hang Mordecai. But you know what happens? It ends up backfiring, and he gets hung. Now, let me tell you something. When you go back to Daniel, you remember all those guys that set Daniel up? They said, put him in the lion's den. They, they had Daniel set up to go in the lion's den. They had the, the, the boy set up, but it was all going to go in the fiery furnace and all that. All they kept being backfired. And every time it backfired, what they planned happened to them. So you know what that means. Whenever you get rid of a bunch of wise men, you got to fill the positions. Mm -hmm. Who do you think Daniel them fill the positions with? Of the Jews. Now, when 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 uh, Haman got hung on the gallows, who do you think filled those positions? More Jews. Mm -hmm. So you got Jews who are in the position of magi, yeah. and they know what the scriptures say. And so later on, hundreds of years later, in the East. Some magi get together and they get all the gifts that Daniel had gathered together. Wow. See, this, this was, see, because Daniel was famous. Daniel was the one that was able to tell dreams. Yeah. Daniel was the one that escaped the lion's den. Yes. So he was famous among the magi. So they knew Daniel's writings. Daniel was the one that told them about the 70 weeks. When the, when the, when the, from the, from the free, from the decree to be free, he was able to give the timeline for when the Messiah was going to come. But before he comes, he has to be born. Yes. So how do these magi know? Because they're the studier of stars. Mm -hmm. And in the few minutes that I have left, I'm just going to give you the outline of what they knew. Turn real quick to the 19th Psalm. Turn to the 19th Psalm. Listen to what it says. Now Daniel would have known this this is what it says. Because Daniel, now remember, Daniel would know this. The Magi are already astronomers, so they would be interested in this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day under speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words of the ends of the earth. He, in them he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. And it, its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hid from 
it's he. Oh, wow. This is prophetic right here. Now watch this. It says the heavens declare God's glory. What is God's glory about? What is, God, what, what is, it, what is that all about? Daniel knows about the heavens and the glory of God. You remember? Even Job knew about it. The, the Bible says that God numbered the stars and he knows them all by name. So they have a name. What really kills me is these people that want you to buy the right to name a star. The only thing you can do is give it a nickname because God already gave it a name. Yes. Yes. You can't give it no name. It already has one. But we don't lost some of the, we've lost some of the understanding of it. But Daniel them had understanding. So now, what happened that night? And what was it that these wise men saw? They said, we've seen your star in the east. Mm -hmm. Now, what you have to understand is, is God is the one that set the zodiac, sets the constellation. We can pick that up in Job chapter number 38. Mm -hmm. He says, can you, can, can, you, can you tell me about Maseroth? Can you ah. talk about Pilates or Articus, his son? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you, see, God already knew about all this. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is what they saw when they looked up in the sky, they saw the constellations, and it was in the constellations God sent them a message as to when and where the Christ child would be born. Now, in our modern view of the zodiac, we start at Aries, but that's not where it starts. If you look in Egypt, there's one of the temples where the zodiac is set, and what is at the top of the zodiac is a sphinx. It has the face of a woman. Now most of the sphinx that we see in Egypt has no face because of time and weather has worn it off. So we didn't know whether it was a man or what. We thought it was an animal or something. No. It's a woman's face. And the end of it is the body of a lion. What this does is tells you where the zodiac begins and ends. It begins with Virgo. And a virgin shall be with child. And the end of it ends at Leo because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now the Bible calls him the righteous branch. And Virgo, she has a branch in her hand and an omer pouring forth seed. The Bible calls the seed of a woman. Now God already said that he was going to give this, even though we lost it, he was going to give this for signs. Let me show you that. Let's go to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter number one. I hope you're still with me. Okay. And if the person sitting next to you is asleep, tell them to wake up. <laughs> look, at, look at Genesis chapter one and verse number 14. Genesis one and 14. It says, Then God said, Let there be light in the firmness of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Now, we got that part. Here's the part we missed. And let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. So we learn things from that. So, what you have to do is, if you go back and find out what was in the night sky when the wise men came to Jerusalem. Because the Bible says that it stood over where the Christ child was. What were they looking at? Well, Thank God that today we have computer programs that will allow you to see what the night skies were like thousands of years ago. You can see what the night sky was like the night that Jesus was born. Now, how do we know the night that Jesus was born? Because the Bible didn't tell us on this day, this year, so and so. Because what you have to do is read the writings of historians and see how they describe things. They describe things based on kings and rulers. 
in the year of Tiberius, da, 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 it would tell you so and so, or in the year that Nebuchadnezzar reigned in the fourth year, it would tell you like this. So we know that Herod was alive when Jesus was born. And what we can figure out is when Herod died, because history tells us when his son ruled. So based on that, we can know about when Jesus was born. Herod died about 1 BC. Well, actually, they say January the 14th, 1 BC. When he talked to the Magi, he said, where'd y'all see this? Star. Herod was killing kids from two and under. Mm -hmm. So if you take one BC, go back two, that gives you three BC. Now, what holy days are happening around this time? Feast of Trumpets, that's when you would hell the coming of a new king. The Magi knew the feast days. When the horn would blow for the her heralding of a new king, they knew that. Mm -hmm. So what was it that they saw? In the night sky, that night, they saw Leo, mm -hmm. who's the king. Mm -hmm. They saw Jupiter, which is called the king planet. They saw Regulus, the king star. And guess what? They saw the aligning of Jupiter crowning Regulus. And so this is what let them know that a king had been born. And because of the way that it orbited, it seemed as if it stood still. And so that's why they were able to look up in the sky and said, who is, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why? Because God told us. How did God tell us? He didn't tell you the way he told the shepherds. He didn't send an angelic choir, but what he did was, well, let me close my Bible by reading again Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showed his handiwork. The king has come. That's what they got a chance to see. There are computer programs that you can buy, put on your computer, and you can see the night sky. 3 BC, 9-11, look at the stars. They're all aligned. My time is up. I thank you for yours. This is the beginning of the king and the king coming. Not the second time, but this is his first time. But he's coming back again. And the Bible says that there will be signs in heaven. When you read the book of Revelation, you'll see this woman clothed with the sun, crown of stars. It's the, same, it's the exact same depiction of the zodiac. So God put the signs in the sky. Satan could destroy it. He just perverted it so that you wouldn't look at it. All right. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Bishop, the Catholic Church uses that form of the mad God. When the Pope dies, they go back and vote for another Pope. Mm -hmm. They use that similarity. They use that same thing, the conclave. Yeah, the other says, when, as, the, as you said, the, when they, make, they went and voted to make yeah. a new king, when the king died. So the Catholics took some of this. Took some of that tradition. And when the Pope dies, they go into the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, he was saying and that. Name, and name a new Pope. The Selector of the Pope is very similar. They have what they call the conclave. Very similar. Yeah. And they, they, they get all the wise men, which are the, right. all, all, the, the all the cardinals, they come together. Yes. And they, they have a ballot, and they select who the next pontiff. They're the kingmakers. By the smoke, I think it was white smoke, yes. they got a Pope. Black smoke, they have got one. They're the king makers. Yeah. They're the ones that choose the Pope. And he, he, he is, in, in, in a sense, uh, Vicarious Fidelity in the Latin, the Vice God.
Yes, sir. Hit that again as far as the timing now, or Christ's birth now in the, in, the, in the actual year. It was, what, more in the spring and summer? Okay, uh, Herod, Herod died in, uh, one B, in 1 B.C., uh, January the 14th, 1 B.C. Uh, he had children killed for two years and below, okay? So we know when Herod died, so we have to search the sky. There, there was a gentleman uh, that actually was trying to, I think it was Kepler, uh, Johannes Kepler, who had done some research on how to locate what stars were where, but he did it long before there was computers. So what he did was long and tedious. But when he found out how to do it, he started searching the night skies. And what he searched was from 4 to 8 BC. And he was disheartened because he could not find it. Well, the reason that he couldn't find it is because he was searching at the wrong time. And so uh, Josephus tells us uh, that there were some uh, eclipses that were taking place during the death of Herod. So we can find out about when Herod died. The eclipse that is described by Josephus that fits the death of Herod was 1 BC. Okay? So then if you start looking at the night skies between 1 BC and 4 BC, in 3 BC, or we would say BCE, before Common Era, we find the skies that look just like Ooh. the Bible described. Ooh. So again, God's word is true. And if there's nothing else that proves the validity of this thing that we call the Bible and the one that we call God, you can't get no more accurate than that. We have seen his star. How they know it was his star? Daniel let them know it was his star. Jesus came just when he was supposed to come. When he entered into the gates of Jerusalem, he entered in just when he was supposed to enter in. Listen, when you talk about the right religion, you've got the right one, baby. Mm -hmm. So don't trade it in for a faith. Amen. Amen. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I pray that you have enjoyed this lesson. Yes. Uh, it, it, it deals with the, the advent of the king that is going to rule as king of kings during the millennium. First time he came, his own received him not. But the second time, they're going to know this is the one. The one we pierced. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the one. He is the Lord of glory. Yes. Hallelujah. He's the Lord of glory. All right, Lord, we thank you so much. Amen. 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 Uh, somebody asked a question, will we have service on uh, Christmas? <laughs> How long has I been? I, you know, I thought I'd been pastoring here long enough for people to know me by now. Christmas happens to be on Saturday, right? We have prayer meeting on Saturday. Yes. Did anybody hear that the pastor canceled it? No. I guess that'll be our service. We'll be here on Saturday, doing what we should be doing on Saturday. Amen. Amen. So, if you want to cancel that service, yes. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, we're we're going to do a, a teaching uh, later on where we talk about the stars again. It's been a while since I've dealt with the zodiac. Yes. So we're going to deal with the uh, 12 constellations and 36 decades of the zodiac and what they say to us as far as the gospel. Amen. Yes, ma'am. I got a question. It may sound crazy, but just for, for clarity for me. Hey, so they called me, then you asked the right one. Go ahead. So when we we say that Jesus is his name, Yahshua is mm -hmm. the name, but Emmanuel is what he was called. So in my mind for clarity, my name is Pamela. Okay. But you call me Pam. Mm -hmm. So is, am I looking at that in the same reference? I understand that Emmanuel is, is describing him, but that's Jesus with God with us, yeah, this inscription. But that's also, I don't want to But his actual name, name is, his actual name is Yah, Yahshua. Okay. But Emmanuel is a description of that name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you okay. want to find Yahshua. Because that Yahshua is what means he will save his people mm -hmm. from his sins. Emmanuel don't mean he will save us. Emmanuel means God with us. Mm -hmm. okay. But 
Yahshua tells you what God with us is going to do. Yes. He's going to save us from our sins. So yeah, that would be it. All right. Any other questions? You don't ever have any questions. Okay. Sorry. Yes, sir. No, there are people over here that believing that now that we should never say Jesus. We should always say Yah. Because we don't have it right. I, I tell people, number one, God ain't stupid. God knows our culture. God knows our language. Yeah. God knows we are sincere, what we've been taught. He's living with the, the name Jesus. It, it works fine with him. He knows his real name is Yah, but he knows how to Americanize in the English language. You yeah. know, so God's fine. He, he's not yeah. up there kicking clouds because no, we say Jesus. It's, it's like uh, in Spanish, my name is Carlos. I know that. Spanish people know that. It's Carlos. But we know, but if you look at the definition, it's the same definition. Because it's the same name. Now, is there something that you'll get out of uh, being able to say the original name and the original pronunciation? There's always some benefit in that. It's just like when you look at the original Hebrew, there's some benefit in that. There's some things that you'll get that you don't get out of. Give an example. I'm using it, you know. If if, 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 if if Pete's trying to talk to you and he calls you Pam, you feel some kind of way when he says Pamela. You see how she smiles at Pamela? <laughs> see, she's thinking about Pete saying Pamela, not Pam, but Pamela. There's something about that fool. There's something about fool, you know. It's, it's kind of like when your mama called you by your whole name. They say, well, mama mm -hmm. called you by your whole name. That was like, ooh. You in trouble. Ooh. That meant something. They called you by your full name. Ooh, that meant something. But that was your name. That was your full name. It, it was the full revelation of who you are. That means she calling all of you. Whoever you are, she calling you. So there's something, there's something about that. So if you if you say Jesus, he knows that you're talking about him. Yeshua. Uh, and, and let me say this. Uh, there were some Christians that fell out with some uh, uh, Middle Eastern Christians. Because in their in a in a uh, Bible that's written in Arabic, his name is Allah. They still call God instead of He's God. Well, no, no, God is an English term. God is an English term. It's less than two hundred. What? It's less than uh, five hundred years old. God is an English term. It's an English term. So when they say Allah, they're saying God. When you say God, you're saying God, but what, what do we all mean? When we say, when you say Allah, or whether you say God, what you're saying is Elohim. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the Hebrew name, Elohim. So if you're going to get after them about saying that, then you quit saying what you're saying and say Elohim. And since we ain't going to argue about all that, let's stop it. Amen. So they don't say God cross seas. They really say Allah. Allah. And so, and so we're, we're blaming the Islam. They're wrong. It's not the same God, so, but it really is. He's calling, they're, they're, they're calling him by that name, Allah. If you had a Christian, if you find an a, uh, Islamic, not Islamic, an Arabic Christian, he will call him Allah. He will call Yeshua. Uh, he will say Yeshua is Allah. Allah is he who is, who has no equal. You can't, hey, that's the definition. He, he don't have no equal. There's nobody beside him. Ain't that what Isaiah said? Is there any other God? I know not. There's nobody beside me. So they, they're saying they're, they have the same thing in mind. Now, what happened is, is he gets distorted by their prophet. Mohammed distorts him and makes him somebody different. So now they're talking about somebody totally different. Mm -hmm. But in the purest form, they're talking about him. All right. We thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to pray.